Excellent. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, welcome all residents. Uh, we've got representatives from uh, City York Council, uh, colleagues, and everyone else who's joining us this evening. Um, so, here to present to you, you've got me, um, Marilyn Sanderson. I am one of the engagement advisors on the York schemes. Uh, we've got Dora Salaki, who's our project manager, and Dora's going to be telling us how well we reach our decisions and the economics behind the project. We've also got Mark Fuller, who is our client lead, and he'll be explaining why other defences seen elsewhere are just not suitable at this location. And Emily Collins, who is our engagement and facilitation lead, and Emily's here to keep us on in check, and she will be keeping an eye out for anybody. So if you've got any problems, um, then Emily will be able to sort that out. Also in the room, I say we've got colleagues from uh, City York Council, and we've got Steve Rag, who is the uh, City York Flood Risk Manager, and he is here to help us answer any of your questions. So the format of the meeting this evening, we're going to have uh, about a 20-minute presentation, and then 30 minutes or so to answer as many of your questions as we can. Uh, your mics will remain muted during the first part, and this just helps um, keep the, the sound quality. If you have got any issues, please raise these to Emily via the chat function. Um, so if you look on your Zoom, there should be a, a chat button if you find Emily Collins in there and let her know if you've got any issues. And also, if you've got any questions, um, then please log on to slider.com. And then the event code for the, um, this evening is K184. Again, if you've got any problems, just let Emily know and hopefully she'll be able to help us out. So. Just to get started then, just to, um, to warm us up a little bit, I've just got a, a slider poll here. So this is just a, a test of getting into the slider. So it's a test of the slider, not a test of yourselves. Um, but we are genuinely interested to, to find out where you're calling us from um, this evening. So I'll just give you a minute or so just to, if you can navigate to slider.com and um, if you can input in there. Um, where it is that you are you are joining us and geographically you know not necessarily where in your house you are but uh, where in the country oh excellent okay we are getting started i was just starting to get a little bit worried then so super so plenty York residents then. Oh, and some slightly further afield, so good to see, see you. Welcome everyone. I'm pleased to see Scaled Gate on there. <laughs> I'd be disappointed if it wasn't. <laughs> Super. Okay, we're not going to uh, dwell too much now. We're going to just uh, crack on. So good to see that you're able to get into Slido. And uh, like I say, whilst you're there, if you've got any questions, please just pop them on there and we will be coming to them at the end of the presentation. So. So the scope of the presentation this evening then, I will be giving uh, an overview of the York Flood Alleviation Scheme um, and the flood implications, particularly to Queen State and Skeldergate. Uh, Dora is going to be talking to you through the assessment, how decisions are made and to explain the government spending rules. Uh, Mark is going to be taking us through the particular challenges so, um, seen at Skeldergate. We'll briefly talk about next steps and what to expect, and then I'll be over to Emily, who will be opening the floor to your questions. So, without further ado, after the Boxing Day floods of 2015, the government allocated £45 million to ourselves, the Environment Agency, and this was to better protect York from flooding, or property specifically in York from flooding. Now, York is a large, complicated area, uh, so we divided the city up into smaller areas or flood cells um, where flooding occurs. Within each of these cells, flooding is independent of flooding up and downstream. 
Now each cell is unique and that is in its geography, its use and amenities and the types and numbers of properties as well as being unique in its complexities which Mark will be covering shortly. We carried out initial assessments in each cell to identify the mechanisms by which the flood water arrives um, and then how to address or, or stop it and at what cost. Now we understand the cost to you as individuals is immeasurable. However, the bottom line, spending government money, the financial cost of any defence in any area across England must outweigh the financial cost of flood damages and there'll be more on this um, from Dora. So, Queen's State and Skeldegate. Here we have a map uh, which shows the extent of flooding in a 1% annual exceedance probability. And it's a bit of a mouthful, I know. What that means is that a flood, which has a 1% probability of happening in any given year. This is sometimes referred to as the one in 100 year flood, um, which can be misleading. You'd be forgiven for thinking that it'll only happen once every 100 years, which is statistically what we're saying. Um, but if it does happen, you won't necessarily have to wait 99 years for it to come again. The likelihood of it happening the following year or the year after that, the year after that, is still be 1%. In the picture here, we've got the Queen's Hotel just to show how deep that water be um, by the river bank. So not a great place to be leaving your car. So that's enough for me for now. Uh, we're going to go over to Dora, who is going to be explaining the uh, assessment process. Thank you, Marilyn. As my colleague just mentioned, in March 2016, the UK government identified 45 million of funding to support work to improve the standard of protection across Europe. We contracted one of the most experienced consultants that we've used for all the work done across York to conduct the options appraisal process. Our consultants prepared an options appraisal report which provides a detailed assessment of the shortlisted flood risk management options and the process for selection of the preferred option following options appraisal. The various options considered multiple criteria to arrive at the preferred option in accordance with the flood and coastal erosion risk management guidance and included the strategic fit of the options, health and safety, flood risk, technical and engineering matters, the environmental, social and cultural aspects of the options, consultation and consents, and the economic viability of the options. For being able to say whether we're able to build a scheme, we conducted an economic assessment before anything else. This assessment helped us come up with the long list of options and is one of the most important stages of the appraisal process. We had to first assess the flood risk and the source of this risk. So we used historic flood information to see where flooding occurred and we then ran a computer-based model to predict future flood events. Once we knew the model works, we had to run for a hypothetical event, being the one in 100 year event, along with climate change allowance. That is the expected standard of protection for York, and it follows what we've done for the rest of the city. The assessment showed us which properties flood and their location. And based on that information, we were then able to calculate the value of damages and benefits if we put defenses in. We then compared those benefits against the cost to see if we can afford an option. This assessment followed the government spending rules, which is a process developed to ensure taxpayers' money is spent in a fair and a consistent way. Based on these rules, the benefit cost ratio needs to be above one to get any government funding and to progress the scheme, regardless of the fact that 45 million has been allocated for York. So initially, we looked at all the potential options that could be provided in Skeldergate, including property flood resilience measures, installation of floodgates and barriers, a new flood wall along the river bank, and a low flood wall on the dry side of Skeldergate or floodgates and barriers between buildings. The likelihood of a long-listed opportunity was then taken forward to the short list by classifying the different options as likely, unlikely, and possible. 
through the appraisal process, we looked at different criteria which would help us come up with the preferred option. These criteria were used to ask questions about each one of the options and were asking if the option would reduce flood risk, if it would be technically achievable and constructible, whether it would be affordable, if it would benefit the community or not, if it would avoid negative impacts on environmental and heritage designations, and if it could be delivered safely. However, in order to come up with a preferred option, we also considered key constraints. These were the difficulty to construct a food embankment or wall along the river, achieving the same level of protection in Skeldergate due to the high costs. The unknown structural capacity of the existing buildings to form part of the defense line, the seepage potential, and the contribution of the Yorkshire water assets to the flooding problem. These constraints showed us that the source of flooding in Skeldergate is quite complex and occurs due to a combination of factors being seepage, river flooding, surface water, and sewer network issues. Mark will talk to you um, in more detail on the particular constraints now. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Dora, and hello, hello everybody. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about how flood defences work before explaining a little bit more detail why Skeldergate has proven to be such a challenging area to protect using traditional flood defences like we have elsewhere in the city. Homes and businesses in Waterend, Clifton, Booddon, North Street, Lower Rebo Street and along the Foss Corridor are all at risk of being flooded but now benefit from having combinations of flood walls, flood embankments and in some places pumping stations to help reduce the risk of them flooding again. They were all constructed by the Environment Agency or the predecessor bodies over the past 40 years and were designed to be in keeping with their surroundings so that people walking past may not even be aware that they are flood defences. Flood defences, however, are like icebergs. What you see above the surface only accounts for a small part of the overall structure, with most of the wall being underground. The photograph here on the left is of the flood wall on North Street doing its job during the floods in 2015. What you can see as you walk past is a brick wall and some closed flood gates that act as a barrier to stop the overland flow of water from the ooze, flooding homes and businesses along North Street and beyond. What you can't see is what the wall has been constructed of and what's happening below the ground. On the right is a cross-section drawing of the same wall taken from the original scheme drawings. Shown in red is the internal core and the foundation of the flood wall that was constructed out of reinforced concrete. It is this that gives the wall its water retaining properties as well as its strength that stops it from falling over when it has flood water against it. Underneath the concrete foundation and shown in yellow is the underground cutoff that stops water from seeping underneath the wall. This particular one was made out of sheet piles driven three and a half metres below ground level along the full length of the wall. Next slide please. And these photographs show examples of the sort of machinery that you need to install underground cutoffs. It's obviously very dependent on the depth of the cutoff that you need and the below surface ground conditions, but it generally involves using large machines. The left photograph shows us driving sheet piles into the ground at Water End back in 2014, and the right hand photograph shows a grout curtain being installed, um, which is similar to the method that we're planning to use along Terry Street in Clementhorpe. Although I think the one there is going to be substantially bigger than that, but that's the sort of, sort of thing they're going to be using. So next slide, please. So to bring us back to Skeldergate, as you all know, the space to construct a flood wall next to the river ranges from being extremely tight at the used bridge end to non-existent as you move further downstream. This means that for much of Skeldergate, we can't construct a flood wall between the buildings and the river like we have, for example, North Street. So we've looked at alternative designs that might be able to achieve the same result. We considered constructing a flood wall along Queen Stave, where there's arguably space to do it, although arguably not, um, it's quite tight. Um, and then we looked further downstream, um, where buildings are right at the edge of the river. And we looked at trying to waterproof 
the underground car parks and the building walls to try and provide that flood protection. These underground car parks may have been designed as tank runs that don't let water into them, but there is still a real risk that they would allow water to flow underneath them unless we install that underground cutoff below the ground to stem the flow. There are ways of doing this, but it's a very intrusive and challenging process that would involve excavating the floor of the car parks and then using one of those large machines that I showed earlier to install the grout curtain. Next slide, please. Any flood wall that we built on Queen Stave would need to be a lot higher than any of the other flood walls that we have elsewhere in the city. It varies, but the flood wall here would need to be up to three and a half metres high along the river's edge if it is going to protect both the riverside buildings, the road, and all the other properties behind it. It would also need either floodgates or demountable flood defences to be built across the roads that lead from Skelvergate down to the river. As you might expect, the higher the flood defences are, the bigger the foundation, the deeper the cutoff, and therefore the more expensive they're going to be. We would need to address the underground surface water drainage connections from the land into the river. Without this work, to modify the drainage system, water would simply pass from one side of any wall to the other. Solving this problem may involve the use of either temporary or permanent pumps. In addition to this, there's also a Yorkshire water sewer that runs along the road for the full length of Skeldergate. This sewer is at risk of becoming surcharged during a flood, meaning that the area may be at an increased risk of sewer flooding. The photograph on the right shows one of these manhole chambers surcharging during a flood earlier in the year, and a solution would need to be found if any flood defence scheme is going to work. Finally, the construction of any flood defences would be subjected to the same planning and other permitting rules that large developments have to comply with. While we would always try to develop our plans to comply with these, there may be challenges over, for example, how we design and construct a large flood wall along the river's edge. So in summary, there are no easy solutions to provide flood protection on scale of the gate. I've, I've, I've explained one of the examples, but there were a number of others that we considered pushing back towards scale of the gate, looking at various options of putting lower defences in and, and others, um, and all came up with similar challenges. Um, so now I'm going to shut up and pass you back to Dora, who's going to tell you about the preferred option. Thank you, Mark. So, as said, from the long list of options, we derived a short list of options, and for identifying the preferred option, our consultants assessed the technical viability of the scheme, the optimal standard of protection, and approach to address climate change, and whether the York Five Year Plan objectives were met. The preferred option provides property flood resilience to both residential and commercial properties. As mentioned, the benefit cost ratio would show whether a scheme is cost viable or not. And as we can see here, the property flood resilience option is the only option that has a very high benefit cost ratio and actually the only one which had a benefit cost ratio above one while all the other options that were assessed have a benefit cost ratio very close to one. However, they have to be discounted due to the technical challenges that wouldn't allow us to have a viable option. Next slide, please. So what makes a property PFR eligible? So a residential property needs to have flooded in the past or to be at risk of flooding from the one in 100 year event plus climate change or be part of a terrace adjoining wall to an eligible property, while a commercial property needs to be the main commercial workspace attached to an eligible residential property or to be at risk of flooding from the one in 100 year event plus climate change. Next one, please. So what is PFR? Property flood resilience measures are measures that prevent water from entering a property and reduce the flooding consequences. Therefore, they help reduce against the frequency and magnitude of direct property damage. Here you can see listed some of the most commonly used um, PFR 
uh, property flood re resistance measures uh, that we've used in other areas in Europe, but also in other projects across the country. And they contain door, window, flood guards, flood resistant doors, air brake covers, non-return valves, and exterior wall waterproofing. On the right hand side, you can see examples of these resistance measures, starting from picture um, A, showing a flood door, picture B, a barrier, while pictures C and D show uh, an automated air brake cover. And um, Marilyn will further inform you on PFR measures now. Sorry, <laughs> I was on mute there. Uh, thank you both. Um, so next steps then. Um, later this year, we will be in touch with all eligible homeowners in this area to offer a free PFR survey. The survey is to assess the suitability of your property uh, for PFR and then what measures would be most effective. Homeowners who wish to proceed can have up to £7,500 worth of resistance measures fitted to their property and you'll be invited to meet the contractors and you can see these products for yourself. Now, if you'd like to find out more from an independent source, please visit National Flood Forum. Um, I've got the link on the slide here, but we'll also be making this available for you after the meeting. Um, and they have produced a products and services directory um, called the uh, Blue Pages. So again, the link is there, but we will be making that available to you. Uh, so there's lots of good advice and information in there. So that is the end of the formal presentation part of this. Uh, uh, if you've got any questions and you haven't already asked them, please visit the Slido um, and pop your questions in there under that event code. If your question has already been asked or you see a question in there that you'd, you'd also like, then please click the little thumbs up button and that will force the more popular questions to the top of the pile um, and then we'll be addressing them um, in, in that order. So thank you all um, and over now to Emily who's got control of the floor. All right, hello. Um, thank you Marilyn and Mark and Dora. Uh, so at the moment we've just got one question, well I've I responded to the one about um, why we invited people from Clement Port to this event privately. So the first question then is, it should move up Bear with me. There we are. That's highlighted now. <laughs> so the first question then, as someone who lives in Waterfront House, um, oh no, that's that's the one I've addressed. <laughs> Not doing a very good job of this, am I? Um, Slight technical glitches, bear with us, yep. folks. <laughs> There we are. So, residents of Waterfront House want to know when the works will commence and want to know how noisy it will be. So, I think this might be a question for Mark. Um, the, okay. The property flood resilience measures uh, will vary from property to property. So, the first point of call will be getting the consultants to go out and, uh, and, and view and survey the property. They will then come back with a detailed report on what products they can offer and what products we'll be able to fund. Um, and then it's up to a negotiation, a discussion between the three of us um, to see what you want to, um, uh, to decide what's going to be best for your particular property. Um, I understand the installation of them shouldn't be massively um, intrusive. Um, I don't think it's going to be particularly noisy. Um, they were talking about, um, like the photograph showed, um, covers across the doors, air bricks, that sort of thing. Um, so I don't see it being massively um, disruptive for people or noisy. So Mark, I'll just um, chip in there. So Waterfront House um, is part of the Clementhorpe scheme. So um, thank you Mark for the PFR references and the um, noise associated there. Is this question, um, so Susan Palmer, are you specifically referencing the Clementhorpe work that we're um, proposing down in uh, front of Waterfront House? No, a way oh, of course. Some... Sorry, I get my <laughs> my location fixed up. Steve um, Taylor, the um, project manager for Clementhorpe, is in the meeting. 
Um, so I don't know if we want him to answer that here very quickly and then move on. Can do if we can try and unmute Steve, otherwise we are expecting the works to be later this year. So we have got planning permission now for Clementhorpe. Uh, we're anticipating the works to be starting um, in the autumn. Um, should we get all the conditions discharged and got a bit of work to do before then. Um, if Steve is available, hopefully he'll have a little bit more information about the noise. Hi Marilyn, yeah. Um... Thanks for that. You, you hit the nail on the head, really. I, I can't really add anything else to what you've said. Um, all I will say is to those residents who are um, concerned about the noise um, and, and kind of the construction program in general, um, myself and the comms team will be, will be in touch with you all at some point just to let you know about what will be happening. Um, but as Marilyn said, uh, we're looking to get on site kind of uh, September, October time of this year. So we've got a bit of time to engage with you beforehand. Um, but yes, we will be in contact, so, so don't worry. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Okay, and I'll try and keep primarily to scale the gate questions now, um, if my geographical knowledge allows. Um, so the next question then is another one from Slido, and I am aware of the ones in the chat, don't worry. Um, is, so as flooding is a short-term inconvenience, does seepage present a problem? So I think, again, this is a question Mark can probably answer. Yeah, I can pick that one up. Um, all of the other flood defences we have in York have underground seepage cutoffs, which is why they work so well. Um, so a short term inconvenience, yes, but over a period of, of, of hours, water can easily seep underneath a flood wall um, and it will cause problems. Um, so it's, it's very dependent on ground conditions and that sort of thing. but. The movement of water underneath these defences is a recognised um, issue that has to be overcome if you're going to put a, a proper working flood defence in place. Right, any more to add on that anyone? No. So um, the next question then is from Matthew Ward, so he asks, um, says he represents Emperor's Wharf and he wonders how the PFR scheme will work with a block of apartments. If there are 48 flats and there's seven and a half thousand multiply that number of flats, how, how will that um, make it so? Yeah, how, how, how will that work, work out with property flood resilience? So, um, with a, an apartment block, um, the PFR measures that we would be looking to install would be for those at flood risk, so those on the ground or first floor, um, depending on, on the levels and the thresholds. So we're looking at doors and barriers, um, air brick covers, so they would be applied to those fixtures that are below that flood risk height. Um, there will be, uh, we are offering some pumps, so if there's underfloor flooding, um, then there's pumps that will be provided to um, extract that water that gets in underneath the, um, the buildings. Um, so as far as the properties then that are higher than that, so those are second, third, fourth floors, um, then there shouldn't be um, uh, uh, measures or any requirements for those properties. Does that answer the question? So I kind of lost sound a little bit, so I've missed you slightly. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. Um, if you have got any more questions, Matthew, you feel free to post them in the chat. Um, so the next question then I'll take from Slido. So do these defences apply to garages? Um, I don't know if Marilyn or Mark, you're better to ask about this. So is that the PFR defences or, uh, I assume PFR and if I'm on the wrong track then somebody can throw me off it. Um, so if it's an adjoining garage and there's a flow route, so the flood risk to the property is, um, is through that garage and the thresholds of the garage are below flood height, then yes, we'll be applying the PFR measures to the garage as well. All right, thank you. Um, I'll take the next one from the chat. So, if PFR measures fail in the future, are they covered for upgrades and maintenance free of charge and to adapt to changing conditions of flood levels? So, this is a question asked by Councillor Rosie Baker. Um, Marilyn, you might want to answer that one. 
So the current funding that we've got for PFR is just for this. Um, so the scheme will be for products at this time. Um, so the current scheme, no. Um, it's just for the, the fit, the survey and the installation of products at this time. Um, the, the funding doesn't cover um, replacements or, or upgrades down the line. Thank you. I'll move to the next one here then. So, um, so David Pratchick asking whether piling can be undertaken from a large pontoon on legs as they're using at the guild hall reconstruction. Mark, do you want uh, to? Sounds like one for me. <laughs> um, yes, there's various different ways of, of piling. You can use a piling crane like the photograph I've shown and uh, it can also be done from pontoons, I think. The method of putting the piles in isn't in question. It's the it's, it's the, the the challenge of doing it in a cost beneficial way that brings those costs down in order to make a scheme achievable um, in in Skeldergate. So so you're quite right. Piling can be done in a number of different ways, um, but can it be done in a, such an efficient way as to being affordable for this particular project? I think that's a particular challenge um, on, on, on this uh, on this job, and also. Piling for, for a long length of, of Skeldergate where we haven't got any foreshore at all um, between the buildings and the river um, would also be very difficult. You could potentially pile from the crane on the Queen Stave section, but then you, you lose your foreshore or your, your river's edge completely. So it, it's a good idea. I mean, it, it, if it was a, uh, a scheme that we could take forward, it'd be one of the ones under consideration, one of the methods. Um, but I can't see how it can be done in a cost efficient manner to make it affordable for this project. All right, thank you, Mark. Hopefully that answers your question, David. Uh, so... Oh, hang on, this is just one again about Clement Fork, so I'll just leave that one for now. Uh, we, we are looking to roll this out to other areas across the city, so um, yes, to, to answer the communications yeah. one. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, this is another question from David. Um, so you say that PFR surveys are available for homeowners. Does this include leasehold apartment blocks? Um, and is this through management agents or lease orders? So Marilyn, do you know the answer to this one? So it's available to all properties within that flood risk zone. Um, so if they are within the 1 in 100, uh, previously suffered from uh, river flooding, um, then yes, they can eligible for the PFR survey. Um, so, so yes, I think is the answer. Right. Thank you. Uh, so the next question. So, what are the realistic timescales for completing resilience measures on Skeldergate, given the long de delays that have been experienced so far on Terry Street and Butch Terrace in the Climate Force area? So, um, Marilyn, again, I'll pass this one to you. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yes, we have experienced long delays with PFR in general through York. Um, there's no denying that. Um, and we have had um, delays in getting on to PFR within the Clementhorpe area. Uh, we have got now contractors uh, um, in place. Um, we are further ahead than we were previously with um, uh, previous contractors in a, in a different area. So we are hoping to get in touch with property owners. We're already getting in touch with homeowners down on Terry Street and Butcher Terrace. Um, so that is happening. Um, and they will be getting their surveys done hopefully quite shortly. Um, then for Skeldergate, we're looking at getting those done towards the end of this year. So getting in touch in the autumn and then hopefully have the surveys done um, before this winter. Um, and once the survey is done, we've got everything in place, then we will be getting installation as, as soon as we possibly can. I cannot at this point promise a time frame, um, but it will be done as quickly as we can. Great. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay, so next question is from Susan Palmer, and she's asking, um, oh no, again, that's 
Right, I'm going to get rid of that one. There we are. <laughs> okay, another question from David Patrick then. So he said, he's asking Mark this one. So, um, is there any risk from overflow? Well, there is a risk from overflow sewers. So surely this is happening during the floods anyway. So why, why yeah. can't we build a wall, I assume? So, Mark? Yeah, if you remember the photograph that uh, I showed during the presentation showed a manhole surcharging with, with what would be storm water, which could be sort of a combination of, of light sewer water and, and storm overflow. Uh, and you're quite right, this happens at the moment and you probably don't notice it because the, water, the road um, is, is underwater at the time and so there'll be a combination of river water, surface water and sewage water perhaps. I mean the sewage would be light like I said. Um, uh, so that happens already but if you put a flood defence down, the down there and you're keeping the river water out then it becomes much more of an issue um, and has to be addressed if you're going to keep the houses on the dry side of the flood wall dry. Um, and it's something we have elsewhere in the city, wherever we, 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 we do have flood defences, there's extensive work needed to the surface water and to the sewer system in order to stop other systems from causing problems. And it's just another complication, it's another addition, it's another thing that we have to take into account. And unfortunately, it drives up the costs um, and, and sometimes it makes projects unaffordable. And if you, any more questions on that, feel free to ask any, any more. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, next couple of questions are from John Lyle. So, first he's asking, um, is access to buildings along Scalder Gate via a temporary raised walkway feasible? Uh, so, this might be something actually uh, I could pass to Steve Rag from the council. Oh, if he's unmuted. Bear with me. I've just tried to unmute him. Yeah, hi, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been muted. Um, yeah, this is something which um, at present, um, everyone on the uh, call here will be aware of the works that we carry out at the very end of Skelder Gates um, to uh, ensure access and egress from the, um, the old books uh, residence there is, is maintained. We, we've talked about uh, a similar sort of setup for other properties along the scale of the gates as part of this project. And, you know, as the question says, is it feasible? Um, yeah, it probably would be feasible, uh, but the infrastructure that would be needed to, to manage that uh, would be considerable. It would take a long time to install um, and then would potentially need to be left in for a long period. Um, People will probably remember back to the February floods this year where there were four separate flood peaks. Um, and the Environment Agency and ourselves, the TV York Council and, and, and the Yorkshire Water and others were closely looking at those flood peaks. And determining what we needed to do to all of our operations that were in place, whether it was flood gates or pumps or, or whatever the, uh, the structures were. And we left that access walkway in place there um, throughout the, it was nearly six weeks in the end because the forecast was such that it was going to be up or around those levels on each one of those four flood peaks. We could well have a very similar situation with a considerable amount of a raised walkway like this. Um, and, it, and it really could preclude access and egress to other traffic uh, in between times. So there are operational difficulties in deploying it in the first place. And then there are, there are issues as to whether or not it causes more of a hindrance than the and hopefully the limited amount of time when the river levels are up. Um, and then the final part is whether or not we can financially justify it within the project as well, whether or not you know, it can be incorporated into the wider costs and benefits of the project, which obviously environment AC colleagues have led through here today. So it, it's something we've looked at, but the feasibility of it is, for those varied reasons, is probably unlikely. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, does anyone from the EA want to add anything to that? I think it's safe to say that, that we recognise um, the benefit of doing something like that and, and, and obviously the residents are asking so there's a, a desire for it um, but I just don't think that this particular project is the right project to be looking at doing that. Um, we're, we're trying to, to, to stop people or, or to reduce the risk of people from flooding providing the walkways doesn't, doesn't do that. I know it has other benefits, but it doesn't solve the, um, the, the criteria that we were looking at doing with this project. 
And I think the other thing on top of this is that the, the funding that we've got um, allocated for the flood resistance measures wouldn't cover the walkways. So it was a it was a number of factors that wouldn't let us have the walkway. All right, thank you for that. Um, okay, we'll move on to our next question then. So I think we'll just to change things up, we'll go to this one then. So uh, about uh, the fact that some areas like Woodsmill Key already have property flood resilience installed um, and it hasn't worked very well. Um, they've already used it this year and they've had free floods and they haven't been able to access the property. Um, so Marilyn, I don't know if you want to respond to this one. Um, so are we, um, so you've got PFR projects already installed at Woodsmill Quay. Um, is the question that your products aren't working effectively or is it that your products are stopping you from getting water in your property but you're not able to get access to the property? So if that's a, an access issue, then we're back to um, the, the previous question. Um, if it's uh, uh, your products are not effective, um, then the survey will be looking at what products you've got in place um, and the flood mechanisms and what we can do to, uh, to address that. So whether it's a case of needing to upgrade or, or um, put, install new products. Um, if that person could get back in touch to make sure I'm reading the question properly. Um, Move yeah. to the next one, and then hopefully that um, president will call back. Yeah, in. so I suggest you either write something in the chat, or you can post something else on Slido. Just add further information. I'm sure we'll know where it's coming from. All right, thank you. Uh, so I just with that one then, um, and I'll go to one that's in the chat actually. So this is another one from Matthew Ward, who is representing Emperor's Wharf. Um, he's asking, um, well, he says they've got a basement car park with 50 car parking spaces with no apartments above that level. How important is the protection of car parks with parking for team? And um, Mark, do you, or Mark or Marilyn, Mark, maybe? Do you want to ask? I think we've, question? yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, thank you, uh, Emily. Um, we've got to car parks, we wouldn't automatically want to protect car parks. We're there to protect um, people, properties, um, businesses, residential properties. Um, we may, as part of the project, need to protect a car park to stop, like I say, that overland flow. That might be a consequence of what we're doing, um, but we wouldn't go out and purposely protect an underground car park. The reason those car parks are there um, is because they're at risk of flooding and it will be part of the planning um, process back when those were originally built, that they were deemed as car parks and in a way sacrificial to flooding. So to answer the question, no, it wouldn't go out to purposely protect car parks so people can park their cars there, but it might be a consequence of providing the overall flood protection. It might be something that we would do. I think uh, if, if I can just add to Mark's comments there, I think it's that, that issue around the, the, the planning approach to many of the properties along Scaldergate and elsewhere in the city where the, the undercroft area of, of the development, um, whilst it's car parking during dry conditions, it is designed to flood, as Mark said, and uh, ensure that the floodplain area is not taken up and passing a problem to others downstream. So, you know, fundamentally, the idea of them making that area dry and, and diverting water downstream would, would be an issue from the original planning purpose of how that property was laid out. Um, but if it was necessary to provide protection for wider areas, Mark's was maybe. Thank you, Steve. I think you just tailed off at the end there, but uh, I think we got the gist. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we've just got one more question on the slider at the moment. So, um, could sandbags and pumps be positioned on the roads leading down to the river from Skeldergate? Um, this might be one for Steve again, actually, because Sandbags and pumps are often the council's remit, um, but I don't know. If you yeah, know I, I think, I think, I think. Um, just reading the gist of that question, I think it's probably alluding to a similar sort of solution that we see um, both on Tower Gardens and and Clemthorpe itself, where 
we have been successful over the years in building substantial sandbag walls. Uh, the big one ton sandbags are used and then pumps are put in place to actually uh, capture any seepage that passes through that defence. And they can be quite effective. So I think, you know, could they be used and positioned on the roads leading down to um, the riverfront to delegate? Yes, absolutely could. There'd be operational um, requirements, put those in place. They'd need to go in with a very early forecast before the river level comes over the stave and even onto the bottom parts of those roads. So they would need to be deployed early. Um, and there would be considerable maintenance of the pumps and the sandbags throughout the flood events to ensure all is working correctly. But the, the real issue and problem with that is, uh, is, as Mark said earlier on, is, is even if we prevented the water coming up the roads from uh, the river uh, towards Skeldergate, there would be that risk of the water coming into the, into the localised drainage system and still finding its way behind that sandbag defence. And, um, and we would actually see potentially good water balancing out of the height of the river um, through that drainage system on the drier side of the defence. So without looking at the whole thing in the rounds, it wouldn't be fully successful, I'm afraid. No, I, th I think you're right, Steve. I, I think the, the, the seepage, the surface water, and, and the other issues we've spoken about would all contribute to that not being the solution it might uh, might look initially that it could be. And also, I think the height you could build that sandbag wall to, would it be high enough to deal with the, the, the large flood that we're talking about trying to protect against? Um, so with building a sandbag wall, you can only realistically build it so high um, before it becomes unstable and, and, and doesn't work. So. The combination of the uh, of that and the sea pigeon and the surface water would be something that, that, that I wouldn't recommend doing um, on, on scale the gates. Thank you, both of you. Um, okay, we've got another. I don't know if this is further information from Jill or another, another resident who holds, um, but she's saying PFR seems to be working okay and would. Um, but the flood water still keeps coming in, so that and you would have preferred with it. Um, so I'm pleased to hear that your PFR stuff is um, is working, uh, hopefully keeping your your property nice and dry. Um, but flood water, I'm I'm going to read this as a flooding is still a um, an issue and that it is generally with climate change and um, everything else that's happening, it does seem to feel like it's getting worse and worse. Um, so I'll go down that stream. If um, if I'm wrong, please just do pop us another question in. Um, so generally, yes, we are aware that flooding year on year generally gets more frequent and we are seeing higher and higher peak river levels. Um, we graph it um, based on the river levels seen through the centre of York. And the trend is that we are seeing peak river heights, uh, peak flood heights, um, generally rising at about eight mil a year. Um, now, some of that will be climate change, some of it will be upstream land management. And we do have a long term plan, um, which is going to be looking at upstream into the catchment itself, um, and some of that will be natural flood management. Um, so we all know about tree planting and uh, better or different farming practices uh, with river, bank, uh, river banks, I'm afraid. Um, uh, and um, we've all hopefully um, heard the term slowing the flow. So we have got a, um, um, an area in Pickering where we have successfully managed to implement a lot of natural flood management techniques. So where we've got these leaky dams um, and tree planting uh, and various other techniques, which each one on its own has a very marginal or minimal effect. But when you put all those measures together and you're planting thousands and thousands of trees and putting numerous leaky dams in, then the overall effect is that we're actually slowing the um, speed at which the water gets into the rivers and then certainly down into York itself and that allows it to drain into the land. So we do have a plan, we do have a long-term plan. Um, it's, a, it's a different team within the Environment Agency who are, are working with that. Um, there are numerous storage areas. Um, 
sorry, just seen another question come in. I'm not sure if that's for me or for not. Um, uh, numerous storage areas upstream on the use, and, and we are looking at how we can use those um, more effectively and um, slow that river water from getting into the city centre. Does that answer that question? Or um, hopefully, Jill will get back in touch if, if I haven't um, covered her question. Have we um, lost Emily? From oh. John Lyle here. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so you can see it on the screen. So um, this is John replying saying sandbags were used on Skeldergate in Buckingham Street in February. Um, positioning on the other side of the road is the same height. Um, yeah, thank you, Emily. Mark. Yeah, you're quite right. Um, thank you, John. Yes, um, the, the, the floods back in February. Um, I think you remember we had sort of three fairly large peaks um, along the Ouse in February. Um, and we did, on one of those peaks, um, use one of our contingency plans, uh, which was to place sandbags along the opposite side of Skeldergate. Um, and the purpose of that was to try and stop the flow of floodwater from passing across Skeldergate and, and flooding the properties on the on the, 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 the opposite side of Skeldergate, so those, those, those houses that come down. Um, some of the forecasts we were getting were quite scary um, at one part of those floods. We were expecting to get considerably more water than we actually got. So we acted on that forecast as a, a, a best endeavours and we put the sandbags in. As it turned out, the forecast, thankfully, um, or the actual level, thankfully, didn't come into forecast. Um, so that it peaked quite a lot lower than we first thought it was going to. Um, but the sandbags on the opposite side could have just stopped water getting towards those properties um, on the opposite side of Skeldergate, um, but they wouldn't have helped the flooding on Skeldergate itself. Um, if we'd have put the sandbags on the, on the river side of Skeldergate, across the uh, road entrances, which is what you suggested last time, um, then uh, again, it could have stopped a bit of the overland flow, but you would still have had all the, um, the surcharging manhole chambers and surface water, and also water coming through the building, the seepage and all the other things. So sandbags aren't a perfect solution. They might help in, in some respects and we were, would have been interesting to see how well they would have worked if we'd have had that forecast uh, been realised. Um, but uh, but, but it's still, it still, it is not the solution for Skelder Gates. Uh, um, it needs more than just sandbags. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Mark has a good explanation for you, John. Um, Let's move on to the next question then. So, uh, another question about sandbags. So, who would fund the ongoing cost of deploying and maintaining this method during infinite flood events? And is it included in current funding at all? And um, so I'll go back to you, Mark. I don't know if Steve also wants to have a, a say in um, Yeah, I think it's probably between me and Steve. Um, we, we didn't look at sandbags as any of the options as, as, as part of the, um, the option appraisal report that our consultants worked for us. Um, if you're looking at sandbags, you, in my mind, you might as well build a permanent flood defence. And as I've already said, permanent flood defences have all sorts of challenges around it as well. But regarding the cost of sandbags, it's something usually we look to the local authority. Um, to deploy sandbags or people sometimes um, buy and, and fund them themselves. So uh, Steve, do you want to talk about, about sandbags? Yeah, I think um, whether it's the local authority or the environment agency or, or, or the likes of Yorkshire Water, sandbags are still used um, where they can serve a, a good purpose. Um, but Mark's completely correct, you would try to replace the use of sandbags with a permanent feature aid something that can be um, deployed quicker with less um, hour by hour, day by day maintenance, because you have to deploy crews to actually ensure that they're still intact and that the pumps that work with them are fueled and still working. Um, they serve a purpose in various parts of the city right now. One area such as Clamthorpe is an area where we're looking to design that out as part of the environment exercise scheme. Um, and we'll be looking at other areas of the city in a similar way as well. Um, but the cost of deploying and maintaining them would fall to either the ultimate maintainer of that wider scheme, if it was part of an environment age scheme, the environment age might, might, might look after that. But invariably, it's part of the emergency planning process and delivery of, of wider interventions across the city, which is, is more often than not the local authority. Um, 
But we'll look at that in the round. You look at the whole life maintenance costs of any scheme when you develop it. And, you know, if sandbags were the right solution for Skelder Gate, we could factor in those costs into long term and ensure that that's something that's funded into perpetuity. But it, 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 it's a difficult one to put forward in, in terms of funding because it probably wouldn't be supported because it's not a sustainable approach to future funding. Because um, you do have to find that long term maintenance and, and it's often greater with sandbags, a temporary defence feature rather than something that's designed as a formal sort of defence feature. Thank you, both of you. I'll just get rid of that question then, if that's been answered. Thank you. Um, so Jill Holt has come back. Um, I wonder, Jill, I do Sorry, wonder if, if Jill might want to speak to us or, or do you think you can answer this, Marilyn? Yeah, if, if Jill's happy to speak to us, then, then that'd be lovely. Um, apologies that I misread your, your question, so um, my, my fault there. Um, so my understanding now that you, you do have PFR measures, um, but they're not, not effective, um, so the water is still coming into your property. Um, so whether that is because it's coming in by other means, um, so it could be that it's, uh, you've got barriers on your door, but it's coming through the floor, or you've got... Um, air brick covers but it's coming underneath your barrier um, so basically what we need to do is is get the the surveys out um, and they need to look at your property as a whole um, and look at all those those mechanisms that uh, water could be coming in and um, so it, it could be that you've um, just something's not fitting right or there's another route that that water is finding that we need to find um, and then see what we can do to, um, to, 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 to sort it, to fix it. Um, so if it's a, a pump or a new barrier or more covers or whatever it is that would be needed, then um, the survey would pick up on that. Thank you, Marilyn. I suggest, Jill, if you, um, if you email us at York Flood Plan, our email address, yorkfloodplan at environmentagency.gov.uk, um, details of what you've already got and we can just, I mean, obviously we'll be coming out to do a survey if you're happy for us to do that, but it would just be interesting to know what you, you have got installed and what's not working. Right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely, um, thanks, Abby. We'll, um, so yeah, Jill, if you want to, and if you want to provide us with a phone number, then we can get um, the the specific PFR person to, to get in touch and to speak to you personally. So if you want to just let us know with that, uh, with that email address. If you didn't get it, we'll pop it into the chat function in a sec um, when I can get to it. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's the same for everybody. If anyone's got any further questions, any follow-up questions they think of, then, then contact us via the York Club plan and we'd be more than happy to, to, to get back into a bit more detail with any of these questions. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I've just popped it in the chat for you. Um, so, uh, and Elizabeth... Oh, I can't see the end of your name. Well, Elizabeth is saying that um, she'd like to say that the sandbags across the bottom of Albion Street last February were very satisfactory, but they were taken away unexpectedly after a day without telling residents on Albion Street. Um, so, Steve, if you're still unmuted, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Well, you want me to come in there because this particular sandbagging was an environment agency operation um, and it was done following our contingencies like I, um, I, I said earlier um, and it was done on the forecast and uh, the forecast we realised a little bit further down the line didn't come in quite uh, as high as we expected it to so once that particular high risk had passed um, we took the decision to take those sandbags away uh, which is why you saw them come and go. It was the first time we deployed them and we recognised as a communication issue, something we're going to have to go back and make sure that if we ever have to do that sort of thing again, either in Skeldergate or, or anywhere else, um, that the, the communication with the residents uh, has to be um, improved. Um, so we've already taken that on board and we'll, 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 be, we'll be doing that. Um, if we do that in the future, we'll be communicating better. But that's the reason they came and they went. Um, it's because the forecast um, that we originally thought we were going to get, we realised wasn't going to be realised. Without the risk, you didn't need the sandbags. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so it looks as though we haven't got any more questions. I don't know if you want to wrap up, Marilyn? Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for um, giving us your time this evening. Um, if you have got any questions that we 
haven't answered or we haven't given you the the answer that you're you know the full answer um so we've missed something then please do get in touch um so that email address should be there in the uh, in the chat function um uh, and it's it's on our um all our documentations and stuff so please get in touch and um if you want to speak to somebody then provide us with a phone number and a, a good time for you to give you a call and somebody will be ringing you back um and you can have a, a chat with with a member of the team um, so I say thank you very much. We'll close. The, I'll stop recording. Actually, let me just find that.